This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital, dynamic, and interesting part of everyone's life. And everyone should enjoy science, be thrilled by science, and embrace science. It should not be shunned, it should not be relegated to an ivory tower, but it really is, it really matters to all of us, it impacts all of us. Here today on Likeable Science, I have John Gelman. Welcome, John. Thank you. John is with the Hawaii Marine Animal Rescue. Response. Response, sorry. OK, I knew it's I would okay. that. Uh, he's president of that group, and they're a, a private nonprofit who basically, uh, well, tell us what, what, sure. what, what, you, what you do. Yes, yeah, so we're a nonprofit. We're based on Oahu. And uh, we're involved in a variety of preservation and recovery activities for both Hawaiian monk seals and sea turtles. Oh. And we're a private nonprofit, as I said, and we're funded by government grants and private donations. Uh -huh. Excellent, excellent. That's, it's important stuff. The, the populations of, not well, the sea turtles are doing pretty well these days. But yes, the, they are. But the, but the monk seals are pretty, pretty marginal, right? They're hanging yes. around, you were saying, about 300? About in 300 the, in the main islands, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty small number, right? It sure is, especially if we uh, have impacts to their population that take take away from new births. Yeah, um, maybe before we get into our main topic, I'd just like to sort of tell a little story, one of my little campfire stories that, that sort of relates to this and, and it speaks to the importance of each animal. So uh, I was just reading this in the Galapagos Islands, some researchers have been following some animals for years, uh, the, uh, uh, the finches, Darwin's finches that live in the Galapagos. And of course, initially the islands were populated by presumably one pair of finches of the same species, and now there are about 20 species of finches that live all around the islands, all have speciated out into different environments, taking advantage of different food sources. So about 30 years ago, the scientists watched and found a one male of a large ground finch species flew about 100 kilometers and landed on another island in the Galapagos where there were no others of his kind. He wandered around for a while, and then he found a female of a medium ground finch species that apparently accepted him. They bred successfully, and for the last 30 years, basically, the offspring from that pair have been a distinct lineage. They're very, they're distinguishable from any other birds on the island. They're bigger than the other birds. They're not full size like him, but they're, they're bigger. Their beaks are shaped differently. They, because he was male and these birds learned their father's call, they all call like he did, and therefore they won't call for other species. So they, the species has bred true for 30 years, basically, and is, is you know, running along. And it, it just speaks to the importance of a single animal, in that case, started a whole new species, basically. That's right, yeah. yeah. We, and, there are so few monk seals in the main islands that right. it's really important for each one to survive. Yeah, because as you were saying earlier, if, if one particular one female dies early, then you sort of have to, you, her whole lineage is basically down, and they can produce how many pups over a lifetime? It depends on the, the animal, but it right. could be 10, 12, more. Right, and, yeah. and then those start to reproduce, and those start to reproduce, and you've got a, a population going. So if you cut right. a female's lifespan short early, it's, it's very bad for a small population. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, tell, tell us how, how you got into this, and what brought you into this field? Uh, it's, uh, I, I actually fell in by accident. I had a career in a completely different industry and was looking for uh, uh, something to do uh, as I got older that I felt made a difference in, in nature and in the environment. And I started volunteering uh, uh -huh. to help out with monk seals. Uh -huh. And at that point, uh, learned more about it and eventually started the, our own organization and went out and got grants. And here we are. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. That's wonderful. So um, these. Uh, animals have a lot of different causes of death. I mean, they're, they're obviously they will die of natural causes in theory, but you were saying at the start of the show that's not very typical here in the, in, uh, the, the main Hawaiian islands, right? Well, in the, in the main islands, you know, we, uh, we think that many, uh, the, these animals can live to be 30 to 35 years. Mm -hmm. However, in the wild, it's rare that they live that long. So if we consider animals maybe the 25, 30 year range, it would be more typical. Um, and what happens after we uh, find animals that age, we just lose track of them and we presume mm -hmm. that they do die. Mm -hmm. uh, the animals that we are aware of that die, we do track their causes of death. And those are the key threats uh, for the species to recover. And in the main islands, uh, they, they fall into uh, different categories, if you'd want me to 
uh, elaborate sure. uh, show that if you if you kind of take out of the picture those things that humans don't have too much of an impact on like reproductive loss there are stillborns there are mm -hmm. aborted fetuses there are animals that are born that don't thrive uh, there if we take that out uh, there are really some uh, several key uh, causes of death and most of them have a, a very um, strong human component mm -hmm. there's disease right. and um, the most uh, the disease that's having the biggest impact on monk seals now is toxoplasmosis which is carried by feral cats mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's a disease component so and then explain to the audience how, how feral cats get this disease they don't walk up to the monk seals and scratch them or <laughs> right so uh, feral cats uh, and only cats um, uh, the 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 para this is a parasitic disease, and the eggs of this parasite actually live and reproduce inside the gut of cats, uh, and they it doesn't necessarily need to be a feral cat. It could be any cat that eats uh, birds or other animals that, that carry the parasite, and but feral cats particularly because they don't have kitty litter, they don't have a kitty box, when they defecate in the wild, those eggs those parasitic eggs find their way to the ocean. And then they're taken in by ocean creatures that the monk seals eat. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, toxoplasmosis is a major concern for us, and it's one that we're looking uh, very hard at, and there's things that we can do. Uh, there's things that everybody can do, like keeping their cat indoors and spaying and neutering. and. Good, good for the other animals on Hawaii Absolutely. too. Right? Absolutely. Bird populations. Um, yes, and then there's fishery interactions. Right. Uh, these are animals who may, uh, uh, you know, get caught on a, on a hook. Uh, sometimes those hooks uh, are ingested inside the animal, and that can actually cause death. Hmm. Uh, other times it may just be uh, on the exterior of the animal, uh, and, the, and the hook can be removed. There is entanglement. There are animals who get caught in nets. Hmm. There's animals who get caught in floating debris. Um, and then there's the whole um, last section, which is trauma, and that is, you know, a, a serious bodily injury that can happen from a variety of sources. But the most prevalent of trauma cases are actually human, anthropo anthro anthropogenic caused trauma. So this is a gunshot wound, um, things like that, where animals are actually killed. Hard to believe, but there, there are people around who. This sort of gets us to the, the sort of theme of, of today's show is sort of busting some of these myths. There, there are people around who believe that these monk seals are bad in some sense, right? They're eating all the fish that a fisherman wants to catch. Exactly. Uh, right. But that's fundamentally not not really the case. Right? No, it's not. They're, they're, um, they're, yeah. They are pretty opportunistic feeders. They are opportunistic right. feeders, but we know from research and from uh, actually observing them in the wild and actually uh, attaching cameras to their backs, we know what their foraging habits are, we know mm -hmm. what kind of food they eat, and we actually know how much they eat. Mm -hmm. And they're not generally going after the same kinds of fish that a fisherman is going after. And they're not generally uh, foraging in the same area as fishermen. Right. Now, they may traverse the area where a fisherman is to come to or go from the shoreline, mm -hmm. uh, and they are opportunistic, as you said, right. you know, like a dog. So right. if a dog sees a you know a snack on the ground, they're right. going to eat it. Right. Uh, same thing for a, a seal. So she's if a, a seal, fish on the line. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, but generally they're not they're not um, they're not habituated to seek out fishermen right. and go after bait. Right. That's not their preferred mode of operation. Right. I suppose a few may learn that as an interesting food source, but. Those you'd have to deal with sort of differently, I suspect. Right. But okay, um, so um, I, but on the other hand, a lot of these things, these seals are, are really pretty interesting and attractive animals, right? We, and and I think don't we have a, a picture here or two uh, that, that we could? Uh, well, well, we can talk about this. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is uh, this is just to review our activity. So yeah, we're involved in a variety of uh, of tasks. Everything from operating the hotlines that people call to report a seal, to uh, responding in the field, to assisting with interact, uh, in interventions and escalations. And this gives you an example, this, this picture gives you an example of some of our activity in just the last year. Uh, so obviously we're covering uh, you know, a lot of shoreline, over th about 300 miles worth. And there you, next you see the number of sightings that we took for our, through our hotline and the number of times we responded. So there's a lot of activity going on covering uh, not only responses, but also looking for animals. Mm -hmm. So when you look at surveys, uh, we're actually looking for animals where they haven't been reported. And then there's the, the escalations and the interventions. What, so, do, what do you mean by escalation there? So this could be every, any, anything from uh, 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 a, you know, responding to a, a report of an animal that may be hooked, 
and then subsequently tracking that animal until it's in a, in a position where it can be, uh, an intervention can be scheduled and, mm -hmm. and can be carried out successfully, and then assisting in the intervention. It could be on the beach removing the hook, it could be transporting the animal into uh, where they're cared for and, and maybe an operation is necessary. Uh, uh, turtle interventions could be, you know, removing fish hooks or removing uh, entanglement. Mm -hmm. So there's a, ver it, it really spans a variety of mm -hmm. different types of escalations. So we're just a, a really busy organization. Sounds like it, sounds like it. And some of these uh, interventions have to be handled rather carefully because of federal law, right? And right. Yeah, the, the Hawaiian monk seal is, a, is an endangered species. Right. Uh, it has, you know, very special um, rules and regulations about how they can be uh, handled and managed, and so we act uh, in a support role for NOAA, mm -hmm. and we assist them in these interventions and, and, and help them get the job done. Excellent. And that sort of actually brings up one of the, the, one of the themes that we're going to uh, come back to repeatedly here is people need to know uh, sort of the rules, as it were, of, of dealing with monk seals. I know one of the first rules is sort of you don't, you don't walk up to these things when they're on the beach, right? You give them some space. Well, this is a, this is a common misunderstanding. Uh, there, we, we do want seals to be given the chance to rest. Right. Uh, they spend about a third of their time on land, mm -hmm. and so they're resting from, from many hours of foraging. Right. And so we do want them to rest, and there is no uh, one of the common misconceptions is that there's some kind of a distance regulation. There really isn't. Uh, there is a uh, law, though, against uh, intentional disturbance and intentional uh, changing of behavior. Uh, so if, if you intentionally disturb the animal and it's disturbed from its sleep, uh, that could be a violation of the law. But we ask people to give it respectable distance, maybe 50 feet or so, um, so that they can rest and not be disturbed. Yeah, you know, that's, that's very sensible. I know with the uh, Honu, it's about a six foot distance because they're, of course, less concerned about people, seemingly. Right. Uh, so, but what, what about in the water? In the water, our, our guidance is to move away. Right. So we don't, we don't want people to play with the animal. We don't mm -hmm. want the uh, people to uh, disturb its, its behavior. So mm -hmm. if it's foraging, again, we don't want people to uh, interrupt that foraging mm -hmm. activity. Uh, and generally, our message is move away. Right. Um, they can be curious, right. and you're in their element. Right. And we just don't want you to have any kind of a negative interaction with the animal. Right. So, I mean, if, if a monk seal comes up to you in the water, yes, you can try to move away if you, if, if you would. But, uh, of course, the monk seal is much more at home and can move faster in the water right. than you can. So right. Not much you can do then. Okay. Um, excellent. Excellent. So, uh, and we, we said there's, there's a, there are actually two populations, right? There's a, the main Hawaiian Islands and the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And what's the population like up there? Right, up there, uh, there's many more animals. Okay. They're much more concentrated into small atolls. And up there, there's about 1,100 animals okay. currently at best guess, and uh, opposed to the 300 in the main Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands. But on the other hand, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands too are more vulnerable to rising sea level, which is happening, right? Right. So there, there is a series of threats that we would consider major threats to the animals here in the main islands, and there's kind of a different set up there. Right. Uh, there, there's more competition. There's less food. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more competition for that food by other apex predators. Mm -hmm. So the survival rate of newborns is lower than it is in the main Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. You also have uh, significant debris. People have always heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch. There, mm -hmm. there is significant entanglement hazards in the Northwest, and as you said, there's there's habitat uh, impacts from sea level rise and other environmental changes. Yeah, since every inch that the sea level rises cuts off what five inches to a foot or so of the beach, basically, right. and yes. those are just flat. A lot of the places where they haul out are just flat little sandbars, basically. Correct. So if little you have atolls. a small atoll that's maybe only a couple of acres. Right. Uh, with maybe only two feet of elevation, right. uh, once you lose, you could easily lose half of that, that habitat. Right, yeah, and that, that means then the seals are, have less space, you know, and Correct. of course they've got, they keep their own distance from one another, and they have a certain level of sociability and a certain level of non-sociability, right? That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, that, that, that could be a, a whole issue. Um, so, uh, so we've, we've hit actually a couple of the, the issues now about how people can actually actively help them, right? the idea of um, 
not letting your cat out, outside, ideally keeping an indoor cat and being respectful. Fishing, fishing you know, responsible right. fishing practices. Uh, you know, if you see, uh, if you're fishing and you see a seal approaching your area, maybe just mm -hmm. take a break from fishing or reel your line in until the seal has left the area. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're a net fisherman, uh, you know, using the appropriate equipment and using it according to the regulations, uh, monitoring your equipment so that an animal can't be entangled. So sound sensible. Um, I, th I think, we're, I mean, we're, we're going to have to take a quick break here, uh, but uh, we're going to be back on, in a moment. Uh, John Gelman of the Hawaii Marine Animal Response. Thank you. I got it right that time. <laughs> and I'm Ethan Allen, your host on, uh, Think Te on Lakeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'll be back in a moment. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, and every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, welcome back. I'm Ethan Allen, your host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Glad you could join us. With me today on Think Tech Studio is John Gilman, president of the Hawaii Marine Animal Response Group, a nonprofit that uh, works with both monk seals and Hawaiian sea turtles uh, to rescue them, to help 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 them when they're in trouble, to protect them, to ensure their recovery of their, of their populations. We were talking before about uh, some of the threats to them and some of the ways that people can uh, be helpful to them, and you had you said earlier in our exchanges a, a sort of a spectrum of uh, people from sort of people who are not liking them, people who are sort of ambivalent about them, people who think they're okay but basically sort of keep quiet about it, people who actively support them, and then the, the odd group, the people who are almost too enthusiastic about them, right? That's correct, yeah. The, the bottom line is that these, these animals face threats, and most of these threats uh, can be um, mitigated or at least reduced if we, the public, has a better uh, understanding of the animal and supports the animal. And so, as you said, you know, that can be everything from negative support all the way to overly supportive. And mm -hmm. our, we're just looking to, to try to um, mod moderate that, move some folks that are ambivalent or negative to the positive support side, and maybe move some people that are maybe overly supportive and sometimes overly emotional about the issue and move them back to the positive support. At the end of the day, what we're looking for is the public to be, all members of the public to be supportive of the species, to call the hotline if they see an animal that might be in trouble. For, for a fisherman, if they think they may have hooked a seal, to call the hotline. They mm -hmm. can report anonymously. Uh, there's a variety of things each of us can do to help these animals, and mm -hmm. we're just asking for everyone to be a supporter. Yeah, and, and, and to do that, it's sort of important people know these animals a little better, right? Because I'm sure you, you guys get calls about the seal pups that are abandoned on the beach all mm -hmm. the time, right? Mm -hmm. When indeed the mother has left the pup there purposely, she's gone out, she's foraging for much needed food, and she's going to come back in a few hours, presumably, and take care of her pup just fine. We get people who, who report what they think is a pup, and it's usually an adult <laughs> as well. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and what are, what are some other of the, the sort of the, the myths? To, the uh, one of the big myths is what they eat and how often, mm -hmm. uh, how much they eat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, the, the, their common foraging activity is to forage in, 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 in waters that are 60 to 300 feet. So they're not foraging generally in 10 feet of water or 5 mm -hmm. feet of water. So they're out in deeper water than a fisherman is going to be able to fish in. Uh, and also they're bottom feeders, they're opportunistic bottom feeders, so they're not going after game fish, they're going after things like octopus and crab and shrimp and lobster and eel uh, that they find in deeper water along the bottom. And they don't eat as much as some people may think they eat, they only eat between about 4% of their body weight, so an average adult might eat between 12 and 15 pounds of food a day. So their impact to the fishery ecosystem is minimal, right. again there's so few of these animals and right. they, they only eat. 12 to 15 pounds each, right. so their impact to fisheries is really minimal. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, that, that, that's uh, informative because yeah, people tend to think of them as being competition, right, for the fishermen. Right, right. But yeah, of course, being opportunistic feeders, they're going to go after the, the bottom fish, the slow fish, the, you know, the things that are more confined to the bottom rather than swimming freely 
quickly through the open ocean, right? Right. They're anatomically designed actually to be bottom feeders. Uh -huh. They're not really designed to be hunting at the upper level of mm -hmm. the of the uh, uh, water column, like maybe other species, like sea lions, which mm -hmm. they're completely different their anatomically. Whiskers are sort of tactile, basically. Yes, their whiskers are very sensitive. Right. They're able to sense prey, uh, you know, even in dark, you know, mm -hmm. pure dark water at night. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're really evolved to to be uh, master hunters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then. Well, now, what else? You know, what are, what are the other myths what, what, that cause trouble that get people? Yeah, people I think in one of the, one of the other um, uh, myths is again going back to the desired behavior. So this this notion of being too close to an animal. Again, there is no law or regulation about how close you can be to an animal. There are laws and protections against disturbing the animal intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the common misconceptions is that this that perhaps occasional or unintentional uh, disturbance. Uh, may be detrimental to the animal, and generally it isn't. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a common misconception that uh, someone who accidentally gets too close uh, is a danger. Mm -hmm. Now they may be in danger if they get too close and get bit, right. but there's really very little danger to the animal. D does the biting happen much? Uh, not because there's not too much interaction. Yeah. Um, but uh, now, if, now if, with a mom and a pup, that is a different story. Sure. That's where we really try to limit uh, proximity and any kind of contact because a mother seal is going to protect her pup right. aggressively if needed. Right. So we really encourage people to stay a distance. Right, same reason why if you're hiking in the mountains and you see a bear, that may be fine, but if you're between a mom and her cub, you are in big trouble, right? Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know, another, I think another common misconception might be that they uh, are um, sleeping at night and hunting during the day, or vice versa. And what we really know is that they are opportunistic. Some animals mm -hmm. hunt at night, some forage during the day, mm -hmm. and some do both. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, th I think we had a couple more images here coming up. I'm not quite sure what, but uh, okay. Yeah, so this this is, goes back to our discussion about a leading cause of death. So again, the the toxoplasmosis in the green is a, is a big concern. The hooks and the entanglements uh, are also a big concern, and then this this human-related trauma uh, is 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 a big deal, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's something we need to face, and it's something we can really only change through education and support. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's so, sort of a depressing chart, but, uh, but <laughs> well, got got to face facts. Got to face the right. facts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's see what's <coughs> next in our list of photos here. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, again going back to what what can everybody do to help. Mm -hmm. Uh, fight toxoplasmosis and the, the, hear the messages, keep your cat indoors mm -hmm. and support spay and neutering. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if, if, you're, if, you're, if you wish to, support stronger me measures to uh, control the feral cat problem. Sure, okay. And next. Uh, so this is an example of a, of a fish hook that's been ingested. <laughs> and on the right, um, an animal that's unfortunately been entangled in a net. So again, we ask uh, fishers to fish responsibly, and uh, if you're going to use a net, please uh, follow the regulations. Right. Uh, example, uh, another sad example of uh, anthropogenic uh, human caused trauma. Mm. Ah. Uh, this goes to one of our myths. Uh, we haven't got here yet, but let's just leave this picture up for a second. This goes to the myth. Of uh, or the really the un misunderstanding about why they're called monk seals. Uh -huh. okay. So there's really two general uh, feelings about this. Two, two general thoughts. Um, one is that they uh, have this extra roll of skin and fat around their necks, and some people believe that looks like the cowling of a priest's robe. Mm -hmm. and if you go to the next shot, um, you'll see that people. The common myth is that they're called monks because they're solitary, and while they generally are um, less. Uh, gregarious than other um, marine pinnipeds, uh, they do. They do. Uh, you do see them in groups sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there's a group here of, of uh, five males mm -hmm. uh, hanging out on the beach together. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, while they are more solitary than other species, it's not meant to believe that they are always by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, wh why do they, why do they haul? Is it really to rest and get warm again, basically? I mean, they're in cold water. Right? Yeah, and you do see socialization. You do oh. see them interacting with each other. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've not yet seen that. <laughs> I've seen only a very few of them on the beach. Okay. Um, 
and their, their reproductive habits. Let's, let's touch on that here because that's, of course, critical to maintaining and hopefully enlarging the population, right? They don't sure. reproduce very fast. Uh, right. So, um, you know, a lot of these marine species have fairly long gestation periods. Mm -hmm. uh, with Hawaiian monk seals, the females uh, uh, start to uh, reproduce when they're, you know, maybe four, you generally more than four years old. Mm -hmm and they uh, have a gestation period that we believe is around 11 months. Mm -hmm. And so the cycle is they get pregnant, they give birth, uh, they um, are a little unusual uh, in, in this world of, uh, of pinnipeds in that they do stay with their pup pretty much nonstop during the nursing period. Uh -huh. uh, so they give birth to a single pup mm -hmm. and they stay with that pup and nurse that pup pretty much exclusively for four to six weeks. Uh -huh. And that's the period of time when we're really concerned about human contact. Right. And then at some point, uh, the mom uh, has given up uh, all the calories she can give up, right. and she decides it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. And she leaves uh, very abruptly. Oh. Uh, and at that point, the pup's on its own. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I did not know that. So when you do see a pup, a small pup, on the shore by itself, it really probably is. It's yes. probably the mom probably took off and decided, it's, like, you're ready. It's been weaned yeah, at that yeah. point. Right? <laughs> Forcibly. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's called a catastrophic weaning, mm -hmm. in fact. And so um, one of the common misconceptions is that, that maybe this is a, an emotional thing for mm -hmm. the pup or the mom. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, as, as objective people, we need to remember that these animals have been living here for millions of years. Right. This is what they do. This is the way they do it. Right. Uh, they're, uh, you know, people uh, who have a lot more experience than me have been watching these animals for mm -hmm. decades. And mm -hmm. they'll tell you that they see this kind of weaning behavior all the time, mm -hmm. and after the weaning occurs, there's very little contact between mm -hmm. the mother and the, and the pup. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So we may want to emotion, put right. emotion with that and think, oh, is that, is that sad? Right. And what a concern, is the pup scared? Huh. And we're right. really, at that point, just putting human emotions right. into something. There, there may be some odd sense of shifts because, yes, the pup has been living one way, getting all of its food from the mom, and suddenly, rather abruptly now, it has to go out and, hey, you're out on your own. Absolutely. You know? But, uh, I mean, Birds, you know, when they leave the nest and suddenly they're flying. It's, right. a, very, it's a big shift for them, and right. people don't tend to think of that as an emotionally traumatic experience for I them. I think part of it is because these are very charismatic, attractive animals. Yeah. Hey, so this is this is great. There's all kinds of good stuff here. You, you've talked about how we need to educate the public and all. Before we leave, I want to ask you one completely off the wall question, though. I'm, I'm asking this all my guests these days. So tell me this, John. If you had your choice of having the superpower of being able to be invisible or to fly. Which would you choose and why? Ooh, I think fly. Yes, I, I uh, as a former pilot, uh, I love seeing the earth from above oh. and would love to be able to do that under my own power. Cool, excellent. Hey, well, I, I got to thank you so much. This this was really very informative. You, you enlightened me. I, I always learn from my guests here, but I, I, had, I would maintain some of these myths here myself in my head, and so I've I've been myth busted, and uh, I very much appreciate your doing that, and wish you great luck with your, with your uh, good, uh, worthwhile endeavors. We want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to describe our activity today. Well, thank you, and aloha, and I hope you'll come back and join us for another episode next week of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii.